The following program is brought to you in living color. Hi, and welcome to another edition of This Week in TV History. I'm Tony Figueroa, the child of television. The graphic will be right there. So, oh. oh, yeah, for some reason, yeah, there it is. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this is my beautiful wife, Donna Allen Figueroa, and I and I want to talk about the uh, Dick Van Dyke show and the anniversary. It's 60 years. Uh, but quickly, I just want to say that you can hear both of us on TV Confidential, a radio talk show about television. Uh, we have done some really cool interviews recently, some retrospectives, and a look at TV history. Our, our good friend Ed Robertson hosts that show. And uh, there's a lot of cool things on the horizon, so definitely tune in to that. You can read my blog, childoftelevision.blogspot.com. And let's jump into Dick Van Dyke. The best television situation comedy of all oh. time. Okay, that's you, my opinion. You stand by that. I, I always, do. Yes, we've always had this debate. When we were dating, we were having <laughs> this debate uh, because I was very enamored with I Love Lucy and what Desiree, which... Is Which is brilliant. Celebrating 70 I years. I don't even want to hear that. <laughs> I do not uh, want to hear that. 70 years, very, very soon. Uh, so, I mean, we look at that. But as I've matured and uh, have the ability to look at things chronologically, I like to think of I Love Lucy as the show that kind of was the invention of the wheel uh, yes. for sitcoms. Uh, I mean, and I want to be fair to a lot of the stuff that Jackie Gleason did with the mm -hmm. Honeymooners. Yes. But that was done in New York. Uh, a lot of that was broadcast live and preserved using kinescopes. So a, a, a movie camera in front of a TV monitor. And it really shows when you see yeah. it. Yeah. And in fact, most kinescopes have deteriorated. They They're, don't exist anymore. Unless somebody did some effort to... Preserve. Yes. People were not thinking longevity, unfortunately. Nope. I mean, what's uh, a rerun? Well, yeah. Well, I think Desi Arnaz was was very groundbreaking in that. And uh, but uh, anything Gleason did, or it, it was it was a single camera, and the one direction was follow Gleason. So a lot of those, and the early Burns and Allen stuff was very much shot uh, similar. Uh, they were shot almost like uh, a stage play. Okay, the three camera method, which and was developed by Desi, Desi Arnaz, Arnaz, and the, the man's name escapes me, but the cinematographer from uh, MGM, uh, Carl Freund, thank you, yes, uh, helped develop the three camera method. So, master the full shot and then two cameras for close up, still mm -hmm. used for situation comedies today, even though oh, there boy. can be anywhere yeah. <laughs> from I don't, I don't know, six to eight cameras, and they could do a lot more work as it said, they didn't need to have the film process yes film As film and wow. uh keep in mind there is uh my best friend's dad was an editor i had seen what they work on with editing where you have a film strip coming in and then a sound strip so it looks like audio tape attached to uh, a film strip so you have the sprocket holes and they come in simultaneously and when you edit you cut both but that's what they use for editing film they had to develop desi Lu. Uh, they had to develop a method of uh, well, a, a new machine that uh, uh, Desi Lu had created. It's called the Desi Lu something, something, something. And you had three strips of film and the sound. Ah. So you had the film from all three cameras and the sound, and then you could cut that way. So okay. you always had a good shot. Uh, if you lived in New York and you saw a show broadcast, you saw the best possible broadcast quality. If you lived in the Midwest or mm -hmm. on the West Coast, you saw the kinescope a week later. So, really? Yeah. I did not. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, and there were certain areas I believe you could you could have the, the coaxial. Coaxial. What we would call cable. Cable. Yes. <laughs> Remember when we still were wired. Uh, so you would have that cable going across the, the country. So you might be able to see it in Chicago later in Los Angeles. Angeles. But still, it was a very... So basic. Oh, and the other thing, Carl uh, from the cinematographer, because they were working in this new method, he had painters on the set. Because sometimes they would design the set, paint it. They knew that they were shooting in black and white, so they were working with various shades of gray a lot of times. But sometimes, if they couldn't get the lighting right, they just paint the set a different color, a different shade. That's cool. But you have to oh. think of it like you said. It was like filming a stage play. 
it's the marriage of theater and film. So and I know for I Love Lucy, Desi knew Lucy could do a show, but she needed a studio audience. She worked best in front of a studio audience. Mm -hmm. So that was the main reason why they had to come up with the three camera method so they could film this and have an audience which would be on bleachers above the stage. Yeah. And they were all smoking because the show was sponsored by Philip Morris. But Desi was good friends with Danny Thomas. And Danny Thomas was working on a sitcom. Make room for, for Danny. Daddy. Yep. And uh, at first, uh, you know, he didn't understand what Desi was talking about with his new mm -hmm. idea for a television show. And, and Desi was telling Danny, you need, to, this is what you need to do. And he went, go shut up and play your drums. That was, <laughs> uh, and then a year later, it's like, Desi, how do I do this? Uh, and also a little, uh, there was going to be an actress playing Danny Thomas's daughter who was very cute, but had a tiny nose. Let me guess. Her name was Marlo? Uh, no, Mary Tyler Moore. Ah! Who was, I think at that point, her biggest claim to fame was being Happy Hot Point in the commercials. The, the, the little mouse. The, the, yeah. the dancer. She's a yeah. dancer. And, and uh, Yeah, oh. she did. She, she was like, happy. I think that was the commercial breaks for uh, Ozzie and Harriet. But anyway, Danny Thomas and Sheldon Leonard were the architects of the Dick Van Dyke show. So I think once they mastered the wheel that Desi created, let's okay, put it that way. This is what I've always thought. I Love Lucy was groundbreaking, blew a lot of things out of the water. You were watching television in a new way. It looked better. There were a lot of brilliant shows, but then the show was reinvented again mm -hmm. in 1961 with the Dick Van Dyke show. It was like TV had come into the modern age yeah. with Dick Van Dyke as we Rob Petrie, television writer, his progressive wife, uh, Laura Petrie, played by... Uh, Brilliant, Mary Tyler Moore. Mm -hmm. It was the true Mary, a true sitcom. You follow the main character at home, mm -hmm. and it worked. It was the perfect marriage of both. Now, this started it originally as a pilot that was going to be a vehicle for Carl Reiner, yes. where he would play Rob, head of the family, head of the family, a uh, different supporting cast, but he would play Rob Petrie, and it was inspired by his time being on the writing team for Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. And that pilot was actually shot in New York City, yes? That was shot in New York yes. City. I think the exterior probably was New Rochelle, <laughs> where Carl Reiner lived with his family when uh, with his wife Estelle and his son, Rob. You may have heard of him. Meathead. Uh, Meathead, <laughs> yeah. So basically, Meathead is the inspiration for Richie. Right? Makes sense. Makes sense. And, and the, the whole bit of when Rob comes home and Richie said, what'd you bring me? What? That was Rob Reiner. Um, right, but he did it. He did a version of the show and it did not sell because Carl Reiner was too ethnic as the head of the family, too Jewish. But so the idea was pushed aside, but Sheldon Leonard came to him and said, you're going to do the show, but we're going to find somebody else to play you. <laughs> And Dick Van Dyke had been starring on Broadway in Bye Bye Birdie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I picture. I'm, not, I'm now picturing him doing the, you know, put on a happy face. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and people like Rosemary had no idea who this guy was. She was the first person hired after Dick Van Dyke, yes? Yes. And she was the one who brought in Maury Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a good friend of hers. And uh, they were looking for the writing staff. They hired Rosemary. Did they ask her if she knew anyone? I believe she did. She she was asked who would be good for this role. And Rosemary is based on Selma Diamond, who was mm. the female writer on your show of shows. And I would always hear that uh, Buddy Sorrell was based on Mel Brooks. Huh. Because Buddy Sorrell is the human joke machine. Ah, okay. You know, you Makes could sense. go to Buddy and you would say, uh, I need a joke about carrots. And he would have one. And so Mel were, Brooks was very much like that. There was a story that Rosemary used to tell that she called Warwick Amsterdam. Uh, Look, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show. What's a Dick Van Dyke? I don't know, but we're doing it. <laughs> and they were so perfect together. Oh, they were. 
you would have thought that those two were a couple. I mean, yes. they would have. And if there was ever a, a possibility of a spinoff, it would be the Buddy and Sally show. And now the hard part to cast was Laura Petrie. Mm -hmm. Just no one was perfect. And from what I hear, Mary Tyler Moore was getting ready to leave the business. And she went to this audition, I think begrudgingly, mm -hmm. and she got a couple of lines out of her mouth. And was it Carl Reiner? I think it was uh, Sheldon Leonard. Oh, actually. I think he, Carl Reiner took her to show her. Put his hand on her head and walked her over. You. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think Sheldon Leonard remembered her as the girl with three names. Yes. That, the Sheldon, yeah. But yeah, because they had met her when they were doing Make Room for Daddy. And the idea was that. This girl could not be Danny Thomas's daughter because he would never have a daughter with that nose. Because she had a tiny nose. So yeah. And Mary Tyler Moore was the true breakout star of the Dick Van Dyke show. The, it was like the main female was going to be Sally Rogers, but America just fell in love with Mary Tyler Moore. She brought something different to the show. I and I'm not just it, talking about the pants. Oh, the Capri pants. The Capri, the Capri, Capri pants. pants. Which was an issue. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, think yoga pants. Circa 1960. Um, no, she and Laura and Rob had a marriage that I think was on equal footing. They in, were equal partners in their marriage. Decisions about their son, decisions mm -hmm. about their life, uh, the bills. He didn't rule the house. No, he did not. He did not. Which I think was also groundbreaking. Remember, they were also, they were the Kennedys. They were mm -hmm. JFK and Jackie. The, the hair was Jackie. The hair was definitely Jackie. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So they were, the, this couple, new couple on TV, young couple, attractive, and they were... Energetic. Camelot. They represented yes. Camelot. Yeah. So, and now that you brought JFK, they actually... Um, there was a re there was a Kennedy reference in an episode that had to get cut that was shot and then they had to go back because they they were um, they were actually doing an episode it was the birthday party one when, actually, when that, the news came that was the one they were doing when the news of JFK's assassination happened and it's the one that I have heard that um, those involved with the show was their least favorite episode because they just wanted to get it over with. Richie is having a birthday party with too many kids. They had many, many kids on the set, and it was just, uh, you yeah. know, the mood is supposed to be light and happy and funny. Dick Van Dyke uh, is a clown in the episode, uh, and it's just... I think it was done without a live audience. Yes, they could not and... have a live audience. I believe the reference was going to be on a different episode that yeah. had shot the... oh The turtle. The hand painted turtle. Yes, and they the, he painted the, Rob and Laura and and Richie, and then the reference was, "Oh, we look like the Kennedys." Yes, and they had to they had to go cut back that line. Yeah. and change it. I don't even remember what they changed it to. Uh, it was something like "We're we're immortal" or "We're famous. something." Like yeah, that. yeah. Because turtles live a hundred years. Uh, but yeah, so that, I mean, they, they did have that look. They did capture Camelot. So I think that was new and exciting for that era. Uh, I do like the fact that they didn't want to have a lot of topical references and they wanted to keep the wardrobe classic. Mm -hmm. There are very few things I will watch the show and say, okay, that's definitely a 1960s cocktail dress. Mm -hmm. But for most of the time, I, I, could, I, I, I could see myself wearing that today. I can see like rotary phones, things like that, phone books. <laughs> the technology of the time. Yes, but but for the most part, at least um, topical references are not there for they're the not most there. part. And the clothing was pretty classic for the most part. For the most part. They did have a lot of cocktail parties. There was smoking. There was a lot of smoking. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were always entertaining. Yes. And always doing shows in their living room. Yes. Now, I can remember a time where, yes, you did invite a lot of grown-ups over. There was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of smoking. 
uh, but I don't necessarily remember all of a sudden musical numbers being performed in the living room. No, well, I guess that was a nod to the variety shows yes. at the time. I mean, where there were several variety shows on. Which was, I think, also something taking, taken from uh, the time of I Love Lucy, where you would have some... Their landlords, Ethel and Fred, were vaudevillians to justify how they could be performing. At the Tropicana. At the Tropicana or some charity bazaar or something like that. And those would be premises for Dick Van Dyke episodes. Yes. Uh, you know, the school pageant or uh, the, uh, you know, raising. It's one with Bob Crane. Oh. Yes. Where they would be. Using, Someone has to play Cleopatra. That is hysterical. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. a, such a great episode. Do you have a favorite? Oh, boy. I have several favorites. Um, tell you what, how about my top three? Your top three, okay. Okay, it may look like a walnut. The uh, Twilight Zone. The, 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 I mean, it's a nod to the Twilight Zone. And I hear that Sheldon Leonard didn't get it. He didn't get it. He, he walked like out it. of the table reading. Everybody's laughing. He didn't get it. And just Mary Tyler Moore has the greatest entrance of all time on the walnuts. Yep. That was which I think they had to do twice. They had to fill the closet with walnuts and they had to have uh, the, the crew guys holding a plank that she could just kind of dive in on. Well, it is hysterical. I mean, just beautiful. I mean, today I'm wondering if they could even, the insurance to do something like that. I mean, Will and Grace used to do some crazy stuff. but just, Oh, I'm sure they could find a way. We're going to have our leading lady basically dive into all these walnuts. Uh, that was, yeah, uh, may look like a walnut. Okay. And that's my boy. That's your, Oh, yes. Uh, apparently, the, it's a flashback episode. Uh, the Petries, uh, Rob is convinced that uh, after Richie was born, that they have returned home with the wrong baby. And uh, the <laughs> please, the, 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 the payoff is so good because yeah, there was uh, another family that or another couple that had a baby, the uh, Peters. Peters, and the nurse kept confusing the Peters and the Petri. They kept 20, getting, room 208, room, room 203, room. they yeah. were getting each other's food, Get, yeah, getting, uh, getting each other's flowers, flowers, Aunt Betty's figs, and so they were getting the wrong stuff. So Rob deduced that it was, he got the wrong baby because the baby didn't look like either of them. Uh, and at the end, uh, they call the Peters and the Peters show up. And when Rob opens the door, it's actor Greg Morris. And I don't know who played his, his wife, wife. Uh, but they, they came in and it was one of the longest, longest laughs life. in sitcom history. They had they had to cut it for the show. They had to cut it for time. Uh, and then and the next line was, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and miss the look on your face. And they uh, were worried about this episode. Uh, maybe yeah. Would it be offensive? Would it play in certain parts of the country? They debated have actually having maybe a Chinese couple. I'm glad this stuck with well, the original. It then they couldn't be priceless. people. <laughs> that, it was the other part of that episode, which I thought was just very, very funny, was uh, Jerry Paris playing Jerry Helper and, yes. and, and Rob Petri uh, trying to scientifically investigate everything and uh, putting uh, the ink, ink on, pad on, on the on baby's, baby's foot, foot to compare. But just the physical comedy of the two working together. Which brings me to my next favorite episode. Mm -hmm. Don't trip over that mountain. <laughs> And yeah, another Jerry Paris episode. I uh, mean, Jerry Paris was always behind the camera. Many times. Many behind times the behind the camera. And he would later direct Happy Days, which, of course, it may look like a walnut, was very uh, inspirational for the episode that introduced Robin Williams as Mort from Ork. Yes. Yes. So it, you so get that little connection. Rob and Jerry go off on a skiing trip. Laura, you know women are intuitive is convinced he's going to get hurt. And he does get hurt. He has a sprained body after a freak accident, something about tripping over a goat. Yes. And at the end of the episode, Rob is trying to pass off that he is fine. 
and he is covered in bandages and just Dick Van Dyke and the, ah, just the physical comedy. I'm not the biggest fan of physical comedy, except when it is done well (laughs) and it is nailed. And honorable mention, Mary Tyler Moore had a really good, well, she had several good physical moments, but an episode, Pink Pills, Purple Parents. Flashback episode, uh, Laura is meeting Rob's parents for the first time, and she takes some pills to relax. And instead of taking the recommended dosage, she takes several, and okay, she's stoned, and it is hysterical. So where at the end she finally passes out and then it's revealed that, oh, I just wanted to make a good impression. I don't think they fully appreciated how funny Mary Tyler Moore could be when she was first hired Yes. on the show. And then to realize just her explaining something in what would you call it? The Laura hysteria. Yes. And that particular voice, not just the O-Rob, but just trying to explain something and just getting more flustered and more and her voice gets higher. And I loved her in any of the dream, any of the dream sequences. It may look like a walnut, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, The one where um, Rob is afraid he's going bald. Yes. And gets the hair treatment. Washington versus the bunny. Where she's dressed like a bunny. Where she's dressed like a bunny, and she's a uh, her raw puppet. That was really, yeah, Richard Deacon is dancing in that one also when he hands. Richard Deacon was a dancer. He was a, a dancer. A lot of people do not realize that. So, and he danced in a couple other episodes. Yes. Uh, one where it was just a party scene, and they were dancing, and then she pulls him up, and he's like, "No, no, no!" And then when he's on the dance floor with her, it's like, "Oh wow!" This well, guy. it was like Latin dancing. It was yes. like uh, salsa. Yeah, or yeah and he's doing, and he's like. Oh, man, he's really... He because, could move. The man he, could move. He could move and because they're so used to Melvin Cooley being playing one note and being perfect. And then, you know, working off of uh, Maury Amsterdam in many episodes and then the occasional Alan Brady episode. Uh-huh. Alan Brady played by... Carl Reiner. Who we only heard his voice the first season and, or, or the back, or, or saw saw the back, back of his head. head. And finally... Uh, he became a character. And, and, a, and a hysterical character. Uh, Coast to Coast Big Mouth oh, God. would be another. So, and since we're bringing that up, Coast to Coast Big Mouth, and it may look like a walnut, was in TV Guides number 8 and 15 of the greatest episodes of all time. Not just in situation comedy, just the greatest TV episodes of all time. That's impressive. Do you have a favorite episode? I would say, you know, it may look like a walnut in Coast to Coast Big Mouth, but I think of the two, uh, just because I loved Carl Reiner in Coast to Coast Big Mouth. The scene at the desk with the styrofoam heads and the toupees, I think is just hysterical. Yes. Him, you talk about physical comedy. Uh, you know, also working with props is mm. a talent. It is. Uh, going back to I Love Lucy, Desi Arnaz does not get enough credit for his physical working with props. Uh, I think it really comes off in the long, long trailer because he's working with the shower and the uh, this was the movie. The that movie he that they did. That was, and Lucy did was it during hiatus? Bob? During hiatus, where Lucy. they played, uh, you know, an American girl married to a Cuban guy named uh, mm. Susie and Mickey. Um, wow. So it was basically an I Love Lucy movie uh, with them playing different characters. Uh, but him just playing, you know, t- addressing, uh, like like he's having a board meeting, addressing his toupee as well. Well, fellas, you know, this is the little lady who put you out of business. And then the other one, he has it, and he's just like slapping the, the, the top of it. When Yeah, and then you have Alan Brady and Laura Petrie stealing the episode towards... Dick Van Dyke does not come until a little bit later oh. and has that, you know, they have a wonderful moment. And he, just, runs in, he runs in to save his wife from his boss, boss, who he just knows is going to kill her. Laura holds her own. She stands there. She holds her ground. She faces him. And it's just, uh, what do I do with all of these? And what was her line? Oh, 
maybe you can give them to a charity for needy <laughs> ball people or something like That's that. That's what he's like, needy ball, you know, and just, you know, uh, you're beautiful. You just love, and then Rob comes in, he's like, oh, very um, chivalrous and just saying, whatever you're going to say to you, her, I want you to say to me. And then it's like, Rob, you're a beautiful girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold on, sweetheart. And, <laughs> But just the whole setup that, in the end, Alan realizes he's better off that she did him a favor, and then she said, "Oh, so you, so you, so you're happy that he is." He's like, "Oh, oh, it's not only not aren't they be, aren't they perfect? They they they're they're killing us, but they want us to be happy about it." Yes, I'm happy. You're happy. All oh, happy days are here again. I mean, it was just his his delivery on that was just so perfect. So again. Perfect acting, perfect writing, perfect direction. That's and what makes the show last 60 years? 60 years. So from 1961 uh, to 1966. And five years. Five years. Five years and out. Five years and out. And uh, I was going to say Alan Brady. Uh, Carl Reiner was very uh, firm with that. Uh, if they were going to do another season, it would be in color. Color, and he did not want that, he did and I'm not glad want that. that never happened. He did not want that, uh, even though some of the episodes have been airing that have been, been colorized. colorized. Hmm. It doesn't. Yeah, it, it is an interesting thing to uh, see the colorized versions. Yeah, to see the because I we, we remember when we were very young adults that Ted Turner would be colorizing movies. And showing them on, I think at that time. And a few TV series. Yeah. I remember McHale's Navy. McHale's Navy was colorized, but there was like one, uh, a Sinatra movie where old blue eyes had brown eyes. Uh, but, you know, the, the, right. the colorization was. Eh. Yeah. And the colorization now that they were doing recently for the Dick Van Dyke show and I Love Lucy, much, much better. It's much, much better, but there's but, something about the original in black and white. Black and white is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To coin a phrase, sort of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they knew when to, and I think I've always been an admirer of Carl Reiner because I think he he had an idea for a show that was his story that he wanted to tell himself, and uh, he didn't let his ego get in the way, mm -hmm. and he basically handed it off to Dick Van Dyke, and he stayed a producer. He's still the most important part of the uh, show but was able not to have the big enough ego and he could continue and, and, and do the show. And he knew when it was time to end the show. We've done all that we can do. We've had fun. We've done really good work, but it's time for all of us to move on. Going out on top. Exactly. And that rarely happens today. Uh, the example that I will give four seasons and out the good place, the good place. Wonderful example. They knew exactly what they wanted when they got in. And when they were done, they were, we're done. done. And it was very satisfying. Yes. <sighs> so the show ends almost full circle where Rob Petrie writes a book. And the book does not do well. But Alan Brady wants to take the book and turn it into a TV show where Alan Brady would play Rob Petrie. Beautiful. It was beautiful, full circle, gave Carl Reiner kind of the last word. And the last laugh. And the last laugh. Uh, there was a new Dick Van Dyke show that also uh, involved Carl Reiner at the helm. Uh, Hope Lang played Dick Van Dyke's wife. They did it in Arizona. And... They did several episodes, and there was an episode where their son walks in on the parents uh, in the middle of sex, and the network lost their mind that that could not be happening, and the compromise was the network saying, uh, if they were having sex because they want to have another baby, that would be okay, okay. and Carl Reiner and Dick Van Dyke pretty much... Said no. And that was a shame because it was a good show. It was a good show. And they had reunions. Uh, there was a, a spinoff um, on TV Land, The Alan Brady Show, which was an animated series. Alan Brady did appear on uh, Bad About You. 
Oh, that's right. And uh, that's right. And uh, Buddy Sorrell, uh, I think Buddy and Sally appeared on the Danny Thomas show on Make Room for Daddy. So mm-hmm. it did go. But it, it it is like so many great sitcoms. I'm uh, somewhere right now as we are speaking, it is on. Yes. It is on various platforms. And it has held up all these years. It still holds up. Yeah. And it. I would say that um, a, a friend of ours, Joseph Doherty, a writer, uh, Emmy Award winning writer for uh, 30-something and um, Pretty Little Liars, used uh, the Walnut episode as the perfect setup for a sitcom format. Home, work, home, you know, done. You know, everything was perfectly timed, perfectly spaced out, perfectly put together. That's the model of how a sitcom should go. And that's why it earned its place in television history. Yes, it has. So, with that in mind... Can I say it? You can say it. Stay tuned.